Jesus called his disciples together and said, Among the heathen, kings are tyrants, and each minor official lords it over those beneath him. But among you, it is quite different. Anyone wanting to be a leader among you must be your servant. And if you want to be right at the top, you must serve like a slave. Your attitude must be like my own. For I, the Messiah, did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give my life as a ransom for many. We read these words and think that Jesus came to serve mankind by giving his life as a payment for sin. But this holy truth is not the service we see in Jesus. Jesus did come as a servant, but not to mankind. He came as a servant to God, his heavenly Father. The plan of God was to redeem mankind. Therefore, he sent Jesus to give his life as a payment for sin. Jesus came to serve and obey the divine plan of his Father, and that plan included service to mankind. Now, we come to the crux of the matter. Jesus was a servant to the divine plan of God, even to the point of death. The suffering of Calvary was the ultimate expression of the servant attitude found in Jesus. When was Jesus crucified? Some might say that Jesus was crucified when he endured the horror of Calvary. But I don't think this is the complete picture. The path of the cross for Jesus began when he put aside his divine nature and became a babe crying in his mother's arms. The cross for Jesus was obedience to God's divine plan. Jesus was crucified when he became flesh and dwelt among us. Since Jesus was a servant to the will of God, then how can we escape walking the same path? Jesus clearly taught that his disciples must also follow the same path of the cross in order for the servant attitude to have preeminence in their lives. The fruit that glorifies God our Father is the same fruit that brought glory to Jesus. We are disciples of Christ only to the degree we follow the path of a servant. In a quiet interlude after the miracle of the five loaves and two fishes, Jesus sat with his disciples and taught them a simple but soul-shaking truth. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. I'm not sure the disciples of Christ understood the sobering challenge Jesus just gave them. To men raised in Judaism, discipleship would be memorization of the Torah and rabbinic law. To take up a daily cross would be foreign to this religious mindset. Why would anybody want to carry about a Roman execution device? Jesus clearly was using the symbol of the cross to describe an important spiritual truth. 
to Jesus, the cross was the will of God for his life. He knew that submission to God would result in a lonely walk to the bloody hill of Golgotha. Being a servant to the will of God was the path Jesus followed, and it is the same path all disciples of Christ must follow. Jesus wanted his disciples to understand that three elements must be in operation for the servant attitude to mature in their lives. These three elements are self-denial, our daily cross, and following Jesus. And these three actions comprise the cross principle. We will find at the heart of the fruit-bearing cycle this principle of discipleship. The first element of the cross principle that Jesus taught was the need for self-denial. What is self-denial? Self-denial is the voluntary act of denying our own selfish desires in pursuit of a higher goal. Simply stated, self-denial is the training of our free will to act against our own selfish desires and interests. A classic example of this concept is seen in the self-imposed discipline of soldiers and athletes learning their trade. To be a disciple of Christ, we must learn to deny our own self-interests in pursuit of the higher calling of following Jesus. We will not be able to follow Jesus and do the will of God until we learn to deny our own self-interests and desires. Jesus is not asking his disciples to follow a path that he has not traversed. He said this about himself. I am able to do nothing from myself, independent of my own accord. But as I am taught by God, and as I get his orders, I decide, as I am bidden to decide. As the voice comes to me, so I give a decision. Even as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is right, just, and righteous because I do not seek or consult my own will. I have no desire to do what is pleasing to myself, my own aim, my own purpose, but only the will and pleasure of the Father who sent me. Jesus understood that self-denial is an absolute in doing the will of God. The Amplified Bible emphasizes that Jesus didn't even consult his own will or his desires. The only motivation of Jesus was to do the will and pleasure of his Father. The first principle necessary to release the servant attitude is self-denial. Jesus made a confusing statement when he said we are to pick up our cross daily and follow him. Are we to pick up a large wooden device of execution? Was the cross of Christ the wooden apparatus used to murder him? The wooden apparatus was the physical manifestation of the true cross that motivated Jesus. When I teach this class, I often ask my students this question. When was Jesus crucified? I usually hear the same responses. J 
Jesus was crucified when he went to Calvary. Is this the correct response? Let's expand our thinking beyond the obvious and see that Jesus was crucified when he embraced the redemptive plan of his Father. Jesus was crucified when he became a babe crying in Mary's arms. The death of Jesus on the cross was the ultimate manifestation of his obedience to God's redemptive plan. The cross that Jesus truly carried was the plan and will of his Father. Therefore, the whole physical incarnation of Jesus was the path of the cross he followed on a daily basis. This truth clarifies the confusion of Jesus' statement. The cross we must carry on a daily basis is obedience to the will of God and the redemptive plan of Jesus. There is another possibility that we should consider. The cross we must carry on a daily basis is the will of God for our lives, but His will also includes a spiritual cross designed to crucify our own affections and lusts. In order to do God's will, we must cultivate an honest servant attitude. This attitude is foreign to the normal human personality. It is not natural for human flesh to assume the position of a servant. The normal human attitude is to assume the role of selfish master. We strive and fight for power and control over other people, regardless of whether it's our family or friends. How do we break open our human souls to allow the divine servant attitude to be expressed in our lives? We can only do this through the power of the cross. As we draw near to Jesus in love and worship, we encounter His cross. This encounter will gradually break down our self-centered master attitude in order for the servant attitude to surface. Therefore, the disciples of Christ must encounter the cross on a daily basis in order to crucify their flesh nature. Then, and only then, will the true servant attitude have freedom to influence our personalities. The second principle necessary to release the servant attitude is to embrace our personal cross on a daily basis. To follow Christ demands that we embrace the first and second principles of discipleship. We cannot obey Christ and follow His leading until we tenaciously learn to deny ourselves and embrace His cross. To follow Jesus demands that we seek Him with all thine heart, with all thine soul, and with all thy strength and with all thy mind. The only way this type of relationship can be developed is to devote time on a daily basis to prayer and His Word. How can we know Jesus unless we spend time with Him and cultivate a relationship? The marriage relationship is the best example we have of this type of intimate knowledge. The Bible teaches we cannot serve two masters. Should we love our personal life and comfort zone, we will lose our spiritual identity 
to world conformity. The opposite is also true. Should we surrender our self-identity and will to Christ, we shall discover the power and joy of eternal life, and the fruit-bearing cycle will be less painful. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my Father honor. Since Christ suffered and underwent pain, you must have the same attitude he did. You must be ready to suffer too. For remember, when your body suffers, sin loses its power. And you wouldn't be spending the rest of your life chasing after evil desires, but will be anxious to do the will of God. The imagery of Jesus slowly dying on the cross is horrifying. He suffered so much in order to fulfill the redemptive plan of God. Why did Jesus yield to a plan that includes such pain and suffering? The answer is simple. Jesus was crucified before Jesus was crucified. The cross principle is so clearly displayed in the horror of this event. The Apostle Peter understood that the actions of Jesus were the result of a disciplined mindset. Without self-denial, this event would not have occurred. We are to arm ourselves with the same type of mindset a way of thinking that sets its focus on the will of God, not our personal desires and appetites. Now we come to the crux of this episode. The servant attitude is the one attitude that must govern our spiritual lives. But in order to develop this attitude, we must follow Jesus down the path of self-denial. It is not possible to be a true servant of Christ unless we learn to crucify the lusts of our self-centered nature. Being a true spiritual servant is much more than helping occasionally at church. A true servant is drawn to the flame of truth like a moth to a candle. Servanthood is a lifestyle of following Christ as his disciple in order to do the will of our Father. How can we abide in the vine of Christ without abiding in the mind of Christ? The answer to this question is simple. We cannot. The mind of Christ is the mind of the cross. Your attitude should be the kind that was shown us by Jesus Christ, who, though he was God, did not demand and cling to his rights as God, but laid aside his mighty power and glory, taking the disguise of a slave and becoming like men. And he humbled himself even further, going as far as actually to die a criminal's death on a cross. Consider this thought. Does your attitude reflect the image of Christ?